Hello, everybody. It is one o'clock on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And with that, we will get started on this, which is the first day of four for the LD4 conference discovery track. Um, each day starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we will have another set of illuminating and engaging talks on the topics of discovery within the linked data environments. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody. My name is Jason Kavari from Cornell University and today I have the privilege of facilitating this set of talks. Along, I'm joined here along with Michelle Fraternik, LD4P Program Manager based at Stanford and we will be monitoring Q&A and um, supporting our speakers in any way we can. Before we begin, I would like to call attention to the links on the current slide, notably the Community Practice Guidelines. By attending the session, you agree to abide by those guidelines, which are designed to ensure a safe space for all attending. If you have witnessed activities that go counter to these guidelines, please report them according to the protocols and policies um, stated within the, um, the content of the bottom link. We will be recording today's session aside from the third speaker. Um, so for the first two thirds of the session, it will be recorded and posted to YouTube. Today we have three talks. These talks are envisioned as individual talks rather than a panel. As such, we will hold Q&A between each talk. I will ask that all participants, all attendees, please submit Q&A using the Q&A feature within Zoom. However, there is also a, a, um, a Slack channel devoted to this track where we encourage conversation, dialogue, and chat um, amongst the attendees as well as the, the presenters themselves. But please know that we will ask that you um, submit all questions within the Q&A space in, in, in Zoom. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to the first set of speakers. Um, up first, we have Beth picknally Camden and Jim Hahn from the University of Pennsylvania. With that, I will stop sharing and ask that, um, that Beth and Jim, uh, please, please take over. Okay, hi everybody, I'm unmuting and um, I um, am really pleased to be here with all of you and um, to talk about our Share VDE project. I am the uh, Director of Information Processing at University of Pennsylvania and um, which is similar to technical services at many libraries. And with me is Jim Hahn, who is our head of metadata research at Penn. And um, so I am gonna start by sharing my slides and um, stop sharing my video. So today we're going to talk about prototyping and evaluating uh, the Share VDE virtual discovery environment um, and talking about some of the use cases that will make a linked data discovery interfaces different from the library catalogs that we're familiar with today. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Share VDE, I'm going to give you a quick background. Um, Share VDE, uh, the VDE is virtual discovery environment, is a library driven initiative. And there are 22 international research libraries partnering with Casalini Libri, Atkult, and Samhang in, um, in the development of Share VDE. Our most recent members uh, in the partnership are the British Library and the Library of Congress. And um, the partnership is certainly open to others that are interested in uh, becoming part of the Share VDE community. Um, the goals of Share VDE are developed by the uh, library community and, um, and they were developed uh, through a series of use cases in the very beginning and now with ongoing um, working groups and advisory council, we continue to develop the goals of Share VDE. So there's a conversion from MARC to RDF is one of the main products and enriching the MARC with URIs. Creation of a linked data discovery platform, which is our main focus today. Uh, there's also a um, cluster knowledge base that drives the discovery platform. Tools, uh, we're working on tools for editing of the data, the J Cricket editor, you may have heard um, earlier in the conference, a presentation by Anna Leonetti talking about um, some of these uh, developments. And finally, the automated processing of 
new additional ad, uh, records to the cluster knowledge base and then disseminating them back to the libraries. So here is a simplified picture of the shared VDE model. And um, it's based on the bid frame model. So you see work and instance and items in, um, in the picture. But additionally, we have added the opus at the highest level. And the opus in some ways paddle, uh, parallels the um, LC hub and the LRM work. So it, it's a, a conceptual highest level of uh, work. And so today I'm going to show you how this model is instanced in the prototype um, that's been developed for uh, the, the, the discovery interface. So Penn's been engaged with the ShareVDE project from the very beginning uh, in its earliest uh, uh, phases in uh, 2016 and beyond. And um, we've been very interested in the discovery side of it um, and have put our energies there um, for a couple of reasons. One, because I think it uh, having the focus on discovery shows the real value of linked data to users. And, um, and also um, allows us to make use of a large uh, group of data that's come from all of the research libraries. Um, so having this large cluster of data allows us to do interesting things with APIs that are available to us. Um, in particular, we are a member of the Bar Direct ILL Consortium as well as uh, the um, Easy Bar or Palsy uh, Consortium. And APIs to those from uh, the ShareVD interface to those uh, uh, groups of consortium will allow us to ease how um, a user gets material delivered. So it's not just about the discovery, it's also about the delivery. And a lot of what we've been working on is focused on how that delivery works. And then finally in the bullet, doing this in a reproducible way. So um, as we proposed this idea to um, the uh, Casalini and their partners, um, we talked about how might other libraries use the development that we're doing. And so the back end of um, it remains the same across the various projects that are driven by the Share VDE um, uh, database and um, cluster knowledge base. And so when changes are made to the, the general discovery interface, they will also be reflected in Penn's um, branded interface. Um, and so we're not doing development that isn't useful to other people. <clears throat> so the development process, uh, we worked with a UX designer at Samhang. And, and it, the picture you see on the screen is one of the sketches that was drawn during a call so the tools that they have actually allowed us to discuss questions that they had or that we had and draw pictures of how it might look to the user um, while we were talking. So not only were we saying verbally, we were also seeing visually that yes, this is the kind of thing that we were talking about. They uh, then used those discussions to develop a mock-up and I will show you the mock-up today. And we are, and also with the, the mock-up is being used for a tech review and back-end development by AtCult. Um, and a lot of this is underway right now. Um, and we hope uh, later in the summer to have a prototype with live data that we can use for user testing. And later in this presentation, Jim will talk about our, how we want to approach user testing. So I wanted to talk about um, how linked data might be different than a linked data discovery interface might be different than our current catalog. So I did this, I've uh, shaped this with using some use cases and how um, it might be different in our current catalog from what we're, we're hoping. So the use case one is someone, a colleague has recommended books by a Penn professor. You can't quite remember the name. It's Kathleen Hall something or other. She writes on politics. Um, so you have some of the information, but not all. Um, so if we were to search this in our Franklin catalog, and here's the search that I did, uh, Penn Professor Kathleen Hall, you get three hits, which if somebody is a prolific writer um, that this one was known to be, 
it doesn't make sense that you only get three hits. So what else do we know from these three hits? So if you call up a record, this one happens to have a little bit of biography in it. Very unusual in Mark records that the author has a biography, but this one did. So the search that I did actually um, allows me to confirm who the professor that I'm looking for is. It's Kathleen Hall Jameson. And if you look at the author filter, you can see the form of the name that's used in the catalog and you can click on it and adjust the filters and you end up with 79 hits. So actually not too hard, but getting that confirmation um, that this is who you're looking for when you only have partial information is something that the um, linked data catalog can do. So this is a mock-up showing um, a person entity in ShareVDE. And you can see at the top, you get an image, a name, and also the information here at the top that we pull in from Wikipedia. And so the user not only has searched, but has confirmation right on the screen uh, that this is the person they're looking for. The pen professor, the name is right, and it, she writes on, um, on politics. And, and they also get the, all the works by this professor. So it's the, the using the linked data to pull in information from the open web makes it quicker to get that kind of verification when you don't have all the information that you need. Similarly, when you get to a work level record, you get some information at the top in a knowledge card. So you get a picture of the title page, I mean the cover, the book cover, excuse me. You get some information about the book, again pulled from Wikipedia, and then you see down at the bottom the various ones that are available and where. So you can see here that there's multiple versions of this available, including one at Penn. <clears throat> so that's the first use case. In use case number two, fairly common one, student needs to read something for a class tomorrow, um, but she lost her book. So she needs to read the first act of Hamlet. Um, so this should be pretty easy, right? So again, we search in Franklin. We get 4,800 hits on just the word Hamlet. Fortunately, the first one is an ebook. Boom, case done. But this student doesn't like ebooks. She really wants something in print. So we start using filters. And the first filter we use is access at the library. So the hits have been reduced to 3,000 now, but the first one that comes up is Hamlet in Russian. Student rolls her eyes and tries another filter. This time she uses language English. And the first hit that comes up is a musical score. You can see the theme that's going here. It's a lot of looking and most students would have stopped before now. Uh, so again, you pick the format book and the second choice is available. She can walk to the shelf in the pre-COVID days um, and pick up this book so she can read it for her class tomorrow. Um, so I'm gonna flip over to uh, the prototype and see how the student would do the same kind of thing. So here's the, the prototype. We're on the page for the, the work page for Hamlet under the author Shakespeare and the student has the button to read online, but we know, of course, she doesn't want to read it online. So she can click on Get It Now. Van Pelt is our main library. And the system will, from the work level, pick the most available print copy for her and allow her to place it on hold right from the work level page. So she saved a whole step of having to find, is it available? The system identifies the available copy and allows her to get it right away. So moving on to the next uh, use case. In this case, a researcher needs a very specific edition and it's not available at Penn. Um, and so in this case, the, the researcher is looking for a book, Hamlet, the second quarto, with a publication date of 2015. We have a 2014 edition, but they are very specific in this case, so they don't want that one. So currently, in order to get one through um, ILL or Borrow Director, Easy Borrow, 
the researcher needs to go leave Franklin catalog and go to a different page. So they're going to go to the bar direct uh, page. They have to do the search again they, because they, we can't carry the search over currently. And then they have to scroll through the results and see if the edition that they're looking for is there. And if it's not, then they go back and repeat that same search again with EasyBorrow. But if we look at this situation here, um, when they're available at an, uh, the, the copy, the edition that you're looking for is not available at Penn, but is available at another institution, you, ought to, you get a different button here a button that says request physical copy and gives the an approximation for when it can arrive. So the user can then request the copy that they want and place a hold, get, place the request so that it goes out to bar direct and uh, will get a copy shipped to them. So um, there, are, there, the accessibility and the availability part of it is really helpful and um, the user can also toggle to see what's available at Penn versus what's available at other places, or they can just go ahead and request and let, let the most available copy from another institution be delivered from them. So at this point, I wanna stop and um, turn it over to um, Jim Hahn, who's gonna talk about how we're going to test user interfaces. Um, so I'm gonna stop my share and let Jim take over. And I've found the unmute button. <laughs> um, here we go. Um, so to do, um, really to acknowledge kind of the environment and time that we live in now um, in a global pandemic when you know, staying put is really the best option. And um, we, we need to do our testing using our remote methods. And um, what I'm gonna, talk about um, it are like a set of like UX tools and um, what we can do with those, but um, more kind of what I was pondering is more like specifically um, a librarian or a library science sort of focus is developing metrics um, based on IFLA LRM user tasks. And that is to say um, using IFLA LRM user tasks as sort of heuristics, um, asking the question, um, can the like reference model that LRM is providing can you know are those functional requirements being met and um, as some background I think uh, many of us have seen this but not all and I think it's important to revisit because um, this is sort of the core of um, what our bibliographic systems are supposed to be doing and um, we can run these heuristics these um, um, test uh, goals uh, over uh, our normal catalog like Franklin or the ShareVD uh, catalog. And you know, typically um, you, you might go in this order, but not necessarily. Um, and, and to provide a, a little more uh, of a summary, um, we can see that um, a lot of what our uh, systems do, um, some of them are very good at s several of these things like um, being able to identify or, um, uh, a resource and being able to select it. Others, um, this explore task, I think it comes from uh, Versad, um, which is one of the ontologies that got um, harmonized into LRM. Versad uh, postulated a navigate um, function user task and that navigation was sort of based in like subject traversing. And we know that like it's possible that other that some systems uh, may provide certain advantages over others in terms of uh, uh, exploring slash navigating uh, those subject areas. Um, so just to kind of uh, bring, bring the cases that Beth was talking about into this uh, reference model um, or heuristic evaluation, um, the use case one where we knew an author, that's sort of a find and identify task Use case two, where we didn't necessarily want the um, electronic access of uh, 
um, the first chapter there. Um, that's kind of identifying and selecting. And then the ILL function, um, that's the obtain user task. And um, I think that those are great um, metrics to begin our remote user studies. And we can use something, um, we looked at a couple tools, but um, Qualtrics, which I'm sure those of you who have done um, any sort of user studies or have taken a survey have likely used Qualtrics. Um, there are some uh, great sort of prototyping features that you can find in Qualtrics. Um, here we can see, uh, we can gather and filter participant metrics. And so um, this, is, this is from the Qualtrics page, but um, we can filter based on sort of the metric that we might wanna um, explore more deeply. So as an example, um, I've created this sample test of um, please select where you would click to obtain this resource is the question. And what you can do is this is a heat map question type. So what you can do is then select a graphic for this question. And then you uh, put the graphic um, after the, this prompt and you can get um, a great analysis of whether or not the obtain function is, is working as expected. Um, so here's some one potential sort of heat map report. And um, we find that this would be a quick way to sort of iterate over several of the prototypes and really quickly get to uh, a point where we know the obtain um, that user case is being met. And so we did sort of lay out this testing plan of what we want to do this summer with um, more live data from the ShareVDE system. Um, we want to begin with sort of internally get some ideas from library staff over what's working, what's not. Um, circle back with ShareVDE um, development, iterate from there. And then we believe we can do some tests with library users um, based on these prompts and even um, possibly do uh, comparative studies with other interfaces, just so we know the relative strengths of semantic interfaces or linked data interfaces versus those that are uh, perhaps not enriched with um, entities. And then we can continue to iterate as needed. Um, so kind of to, to draw, this, draw this down and into a summary, we're moving toward a, a production implementation with our uh, production data. Um, we do want to support that implementation with iterative user tests framed by these IFLA LRM user tasks. And we see a potential integration into discovery offerings um, through Penn, other partner libraries. And I, and I would just kind of parenthetically note um, here that this in, the integration is successful if we can understand um, you know, what user tasks are better supported by um, what parts of the interface. And so some, somewhat deconstructing the interface into the pieces that work best um, either by an API or um, by um, you know, recognizing the pattern strings that are coming into our discovery interface and then uh, promoting the resource that would best uh, match that user case. Um, we believe is um, sort of a, a step forward for, for discovery and sort of enhance our discovery of collections overall. So um, here are, we have some resources and our slides will be available. Um, and then um, we can, Beth and I can take questions now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to um, both Beth and Jim for, for that talk. Uh, I would like to remind all attendees that you are more than welcome, encouraged to, uh, to put, um, to put your questions into the Q and A uh, with at the bottom, which should be appearing somewhere at the bottom of your screen, um, depending on how your windows are all set up. Uh, we do have a question or a few questions coming in. Uh, have you considered using your faculty pages for the entity identification, or does that not work because the wiki is open data while the faculty page is not? Um, and then there's comments. Um, it, it's an interesting question um, that. Um, and the, an the answer is it's difficult to do at Penn because there are um, many different ways in which faculty can do their own pa personal pages. It tends to vary by school and how much each of the schools within Penn has something set up for that. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's not like an easy thing for us to hook in. We've done some experimentations recently uh, with 
um, using Wikidata, and we did a couple of departments uh, with linking Wikidata entries for the faculty to their works. And so we're hoping that that might have some fruition. Um, we've shared those Wikidata links along with NACO and ISNI links with ShareVDE to, for them to explore possibilities for our faculty linking. Great, thank you. Um, there was a request that your resources um, slide be shared uh, again, if you could either uh, repost, if you could either put that back up or if you wouldn't mind maybe posting a link, links to those resources in the Slack channel for this track. Um, either way works well, I think. Um, uh, the another question that came in is about use cases. What use cases, if any, have you found that can only be supported with cataloging created in BibFrame natively rather than converted from Mark? Hmm. That's a good question. I I only we only really are at the hypothesis uh, stage for this, but uh, I think work to work relationships uh, potentially. Um, although there's, um, you know, con converted from Mark. It depends on the conversion. I think if um, uh, the conversion from Mark, if it um, if there's the right type of clustering, you might be able to get work to work relationships. Now, um, I think that um, when you start with BibFrame, though, um, at least you're looking for um, work, you know, potentially um, you can add a, a work relationship or even potentially a, uh, you can say that the work that you're cataloging is uh, an expression of some uh, hub or super work. Um, so that, I mean, some of the relationships I would think might might be but that's still in the hypothesis stage. And yeah, we, we want to test that. That's a really great question. Great. Um, another question. Uh, Paloma is wondering if you have or are planning to test the UI with rare books and special collections users, um, which would also be interested in material evidence of the resources in addition to its bibliographic aspects. Um. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting use case to the rare books. And um, I think in the early development of ShareVDE, the, the thinking was a much more streamlined, simplified uh, interface that might lose some of the item specific information that's so critical for rare books researchers. Um, and I know when during our um, talks with the designer, uh, we definitely uh, did some work on the um, rare book use case and some of the kinds of notes that only show up in rare materials. Um, I don't have any screenshots of what those would look like, but it's certainly something we're interested in. And we we would really want to test from all kinds of angles um, that with live data because so much of, uh, of our databases are unique in different ways. I mean, if you think about other types of users that are unique to musical users looking for scores and sound recordings and how those link at the work level um, <clears throat> and um, other unique cases that we might not see in a small prototype like I showed today but would become evident once we have our full set of live data. Great, thank you. And we have just enough time for one more question and conveniently have one more. Um, is the item level data such as location call number that you showed um, in the interface also entities or is that some sort of ILS inventory lookup? Um, it's a combination of both. So um, we are currently updating the data that we send to the cluster knowledge base to include the static kind of item data, such as the location and the call number that doesn't change frequently. But also, um, ShareVD will be using um, the Alma API to get the um, live um, data about availability as part of the, the lookup. So that, that part of it will be um, done live using the API. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, that not only was it incredibly um, informative and interesting, but exactly on time, which is always well appreciated. Um, <laughs> so with that, we are actually going to move on to our next talk.
um, which is by Huda Khan from Cornell University and Astrid Usong from Stanford University. Um, Huda and Astrid, uh, take it away, please. Thanks, Jason. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, so hi, I'm in the class, um, pointed out from Cornell University and I'm Astrid. I'm a UX designer from Stanford. Okay, so um, I guess we can stop our video and then we'll just go through the slides until it's our turn again. If I can figure out the controls to do that. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for to all of you for being here. Um, I want to also thank um, Astrid, of course, and uh, Jesse Keck for suggesting the title because I was out of ideas for snazzy titles and he came up with this one. Um, and what we're going to talk about is our experiments and prototypes and user evaluations we did around the larger question of how can we integrate linked data into discovery into library catalog discovery. So we'll start a little bit with the background and motivation. Then we're going to do a whirlwind tour of all of the approaches that we took because it's a lot. Um, we actually won't be able to cover everything, but hopefully you'll get a taste of the kinds of things that we did and what we learned. We'll talk about um, user feedback um, and the lessons we learned from evaluations and end with um, how some of this work, uh, we hope to keep continuing it um, and where we could, we would love your contributions from the larger community and um, definitely engaging in uh, more conversations with everyone around, that, around the work we're doing. So um, Anyone familiar with how library catalogs are set up, whether from the metadata angle or from the development angle, knows that a, uh, a big focus of the work that we do is being able to support users in what's known as a known item search, which basically means that by the time the user has come to the catalog, they've done some of the exploratory research or kind of mulling over what concepts they're interested in and which authors they want to look up. And they either have a very specific title in mind and just want to get that resource, or they have um, an author or a subject that uh, they may want to search specifically. And so what we wanted to do is see if we can expand that to more open-ended discovery and work on bringing in context around people, subjects, and works in relevant relationships. So those of you that just saw the ShareVDE presentation will see some similarities in, in the kinds of questions that we're trying to address. And the work we did is, was part of the Link Data for Pathways to Implementation project, or LD for P2, which just ended at the end of June. And that's a project where multiple institutions came together to try to really understand and implement um, the shift uh, for cataloging, for metadata, for discovery to link data. Uh, what does it take and, and how do we get there um, in practice uh, and practically? Um, I don't think I need to necessarily go through these slides for many of you, um, but it might be helpful to some. Um, and it's a definitely a, a good thing to kind of step back and think about this in terms of entities. So um, there are already links to um, people and subjects um, that we have embedded in our catalogs now, but they take the form of the string heading. So Lincoln and the Bardo is written by George Saunders, and you have this particular string that um, identifies them. And when we talk about moving from strings to things and link datafying things, we're saying we have these authorities, we have these subject headings, um, can we get URIs for them? And when we get URIs for them, what that allows us then to do is go out to other link data sources out there in the world and see which relationships we can then retrieve and use for display, for navigation, for search. Um, because a lot of the information of, that might be in external linked data sources doesn't necessarily belong within the catalog itself, but it can be very useful to provide content to our users. So the questions that motivated the work that we're talking about right now are um, they're of two flavors. The first one, which is the primary focus of this presentation, is really which discovery tasks can we support uh, for users by integrating linked data. And then the second question, which is also of, of importance, is in addition to being able to uh, allow for people to use the library catalog to discover resources and, and more open-ended tasks, um, 
can we support the discovery of catalog resources on the web and um, through search engines? And the four areas that where we'll be providing a whirlwind tour are knowledge panels, browsing, uh, search suggestions or semantic search, and schema.org output. But before we go through that, um, Astrid will talk about um, why we picked these areas. Right, thanks, Hida. So why these four integration areas, other than they're listed in the grant? Um, so before we did more specific user research on the integration areas, we went back to square one and asked users how they conduct research. So what we found was this dichotomy of experienced versus inexperienced researchers, which had really interesting effects on the testing results, which we'll discuss in a bit. Um, but we also noticed similar interaction patterns that all the researchers were using because they're using similar tools, such as Google search or library catalogs, digital depositories, databases, etc. Um, so because researchers are already utilizing these tools, um, such as knowledge panels, browsing, related search, um, and autocomplete, we wanted to meet the user where they already were and improve upon these experiences. So, and as you'll see, we're not trying to replace or even be as good as Google search. I think that that would be a stretch. Um, what we're aiming for is an improved library catalog experience um, that is stickier, meaning that users are able to do more in that one place and stick around rather than relying so heavily on other tools. So you'll see that theme um, recurring throughout the research that we did. Thank you, Astrid. All right, so now for the tour. Um, so we're gonna start with knowledge panels. And before I actually start the tour, just a quick note that what you're seeing here are uh, the end results of this work were a set of functional prototypes in Blacklight. Um, we used as real data as we could get. So we relied heavily on production catalog data or excerpts of production catalog data and the data sources that you're seeing. Um, and they'll be listed on the slides. Again, I don't have time. We don't have time to go through all the details, but we're hoping this will give you an idea of the kinds of, of, of kind of work that we did. So starting off with knowledge panels, um, those of you familiar with how Google tends to show little entity boxes when you type in a search result should understand uh, the kind of uh, motivation behind having a knowledge panel. It allows you to see contextual information and highlights um, entities of interest. Uh, we're also interested in being able to pull in information from uh, Cornell or from library specific collections. So you'll see some examples of that in a minute. So uh, our current production site at Cornell, um, here's a screenshot of that from a few months ago. Uh, it should look about the same, other than the COVID flashing banners that we have now. They're not flashing, but they are banners. Um, and so here we have Lincoln and the Bardo, which is an item um, in our catalog. And uh, we already had a little, um, we had an info button next to the authors, which opened up information using authorized um, heading information that we had in the catalog. So in our prototype, we took that and we extended that to include information from Wikidata. So now we're bringing in information like uh, image, um, relevant Wikidata URIs or equivalent URIs, and then relationships such as um, other people that influenced or in, were influenced by George Saunders. And so this includes, for instance, John Updike. And if you wanted to, you could click on that, see search results in the catalog about John Updike, or also look at um, uh, links to URIs. Um, similarly, we expanded the functionality that's already there to include knowledge panels for subjects. So now this is a subject for the work that's uh, the, it's Abraham Lincoln, and you can see information from Wikidata coming in. And you can also see digital collection results. So this is a portal that is not included in the library catalog technically, but um, has interesting and important information that we would like to um, explore. Um, Stanford, uh, the Stanford team also worked on knowledge panel experiments. So here you're looking at a page for the Blade Runner movie. And uh, we have information about creators and contributors in our catalog, but this allows us to bring in specific relationships and information like cast members, derivative works, and narrative location. And if you've selected an author, uh, that means that you've made a choice and you're, uh, you're saying that you're interested specifically in works by Maya Angelou, so we take that to then generate this knowledge panel on the search results page that highlights um, the selected author and in this case is showing us uh, notable works occupation information coming from Wikidata. 
And there's a little blurb here that says if you want to contribute back to the source um, to Wikidata, you can do so as well. Here's an example where you can actually play a music clip um, that this is being done by uh, using the connections to Wikidata um, and Wikimedia. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could actually play this within the browser. So those are examples of, uh, there are actually two different ways of representing knowledge panels within the interface, both of which are taking information from other sources and then displaying them to the user. Here's another way of, of including information. This is an example where we took Discogs information and are using it to supplement the display of uh, this particular album in our catalog. And technically, yes, Discogs is not a lead data source, but our colleagues, Tim Worrell, Lynette Rail, and Dave Eichmann worked on uh, being able for us, be, uh, making us able to get this information in a linked data format. All the fields in blue are the ones that are being supplemented. So you can see there's a lot here on this page. And you can also take that Discogs information and use it to find connections to Wikidata. So with the Discogs information in hand, you can find preceding and following works. Here's another example of uh, an in-page in display of information coming from Wikidata, in this case, a narrative location. And if you click on the little I button, you can get a little leaflet map uh, based on that. So there, I, we are not going to be able to show you all the relationships and all the queries that go into it, but here's a quick overview, for instance, of uh, part of the knowledge panel that you just saw. If you have the Library of Congress URI, either by resolving against the string or if you already had ID somewhere, um, you can use that to then go into Wikidata, find the equivalent URI in Wikidata, and then query relationships that can bring back information like notable works and influences and images. So I'll hand it over to Astrid now. So knowledge panels were very favorably received. Um, one user said they were the bomb.com. That's how awesome they were. Um, so how we did user research for knowledge pan panels was um, we did guerrilla user testing at um, one of the Stanford libraries, which entailed a couple of us sitting at a table by the entrance with a sign. And then we had a display of candy bars and protein bars. Um, and we basically would approach students and say, hey, will you give us some feedback? We'll give you a candy bar for 10 minutes of your time. Um, so that worked pretty well. And we took them through a series of prototypes and had them comment on them. And not only did we want to know would they use it, but also how would they use it. And this is where we started to learn how knowledge panels made the catalog stickier, because they would no longer have to go toggle back and forth between Google and Wikipedia for more info on whatever they were researching. They could stay right there and get the information. Um, we also started seeing differences um, between the experienced and inexperienced users. So inexperienced users wanted all the information they could give them um, in the knowledge panel. They were interested in, um, you know, if it was an author, like biographical facts, um, just basic information. Um, the experienced users wanted something a little bit more analytical. They were, if it was an author, they wanted to know, you know, who influenced the author, what were their beliefs, what were they significant for. Um, so it was interesting to see the differences between the two, but bottom line was that um, the knowledge panels were very helpful and they would definitely like to see those in the catalog. Yeah, um, it was a bomb.com, which is actually a good thing. So that was great. Thank you, Astrid. So moving on in our tour, um, our next stop is browsing. And browsing is a very sort of almost nebulous concept, like how do you actually operationalize browsing? So the way we thought about it is, um, is there a way to help users navigate from higher level categories or utilize the relationships either in the catalog data or between the catalog data and other sources um, to uh, uh, see where they're going, find related concepts and navigate the content in the library. Again, we tried multiple experiments. Uh, we're not gonna have time to go over all of them, but I'll, uh, we'll just look at subjects and authors for now. We did also do a call number browse, just FYI, but um, we'll tell, we can talk about that some other time. And again, there's documentation for this um, and uh, we're always available for questions and conversation. So this is a subject browse example. What we did is we tried to take high level categories that were not so numerous that it would overwhelm the user. So we picked the Library of Congress top level classifications. You click on philosophy, psychology, and religion. It shows you sub uh, classifications and it also shows you the Library of Congress subject headings that are related to that. So if you're interested, let's say now in Abbey's, you can see on this on the right side um, how there are broader end 
narrower concepts related to abbeys, and you could further expand these and kind of walk the hierarchy here. Um, and you can also see search results on the bottom. And from any of these links, abbeys or convents, et cetera, if I, for instance, click on abbeys, it will take me directly to the search page um, for that subject. And we also included a browse button right next to the subject so that if you're looking at something, you can always kind of drop back in here to see how it relates to the relationships and the hierarchy of concepts. We were also interested in seeing what we could do for authors. So what we did is we generated a timeline using information from both Library of Congress and Wikidata. So you could click on one of these years and see information around that year. And um, uh, we used Histopedia to generate it, which is an open source or an available tool. If you click on one of these, you see a mini knowledge panel. You can see we like knowledge panels, but there's like a little uh, panel here that shows you that the birth and death date are actually from two different sources, Wikidata and Library of Congress, some description from Wikidata, and it also links to the search results. So you can kind of go through these people and get a sense of when they, when they were alive or when their um, activity dates are coming back from Wikidata. Now, knowledge panel work was all real-time display. So these are queries that are happening live when you load the page or you look at something. Um, in the case of these two browsing examples, we set up separate indices that could integrate information from multiple sources and then run the, uh, be able to generate the interface we saw. So very quickly, uh, in the case of author timelines, if we start out again with the Library of Congress URI, you can then find equivalent Wikidata URIs and then utilize the information from both of those to generate the index that powers the timeline. So I'll stop for a minute and hand it over to Astrid. So um, we did another round of guerrilla testing at a Stanford library. Um, and this was a, another great way for the inexperienced researchers to, to search. Um, they really valued it because they could, they're at the beginning of their search, um, it could lead them to different pathways. Um, they could do, you know, different types of search, call number, time, place, et cetera. Um, and it was really a, a great way for them to discover, like, um, you know, at the beginning of their search, like, um, you know, more focused paths that they could take. Um, subject matter experts, on the other hand, were a tougher sell. They didn't find as much value and had trouble imagining how they would use it unless it was to research something that was new to them. So um, one use case a grad student came up with that, um, you know, for this particular browse um, was it could be useful for her in researching um, an obscure village name, um, which also happened to be a common word in another language. So in this case, she thought the geographic browse would be helpful because it would exclude the unrelated search results and it would search high quality materials in the library rather than, you know, her being on the general website and, um, or the general internet and just finding random websites. So um, still more work to be done on this, but there's definitely some promise here. Thank you. Okay, next up, we're gonna go over this really quickly on the next two ones. So related search results. Um, we, we have the term semantic search given to us or one that we were exploring. And the idea really is, is there a way we can bridge this uh, gap between the user's uh, natural language terms and the vocabularies we use in the catalog? So can we provide suggestions, whether in terms of here are related entities or here are results based on what the user types in and the information embedded in, in the hierarchies of linked data information that we have? So uh, this is a case where someone's typed in myocardial infarction and you can see that there are two sets of results here. One is a set of related subject searches and one is a set of people searches on the left. And there is more than one result here because we were, at this point, we were trying to experiment with as many, as much information as we could get back. So a wide variety of suggestions. Um, and for each of those, you can click on the suggestion in this list and then see a, a mini panel that shows more information. So for subjects, you could see broader and narrower subjects. For a person, you might be able to see um, a, a short description and contemporaries that lived at the same time. So here's a similar example where you've typed in Charles Dickens. So you can see English literature here and a picture of Dickens. Um, here you can see that for Dickens, one of the results is, is uh, an English novelist from the 19th century in their biographies. Um, and here you can see that it says source, Anif and source, Elsianiaf. LC, and that was less for the users and really more for us. So I'm gonna to skip to this really quickly. Um, what you were seeing in the results set over there are actually the results of three separate types of queries and information coming back. 
The first set is taking the facet strings and resolving them to URIs. And what this allows us to do is then if you click on any of those, you can see more information. The second are lookups against questioning authority, which is a gem that allows uh, linked data lookups uh, or is one that uh, was extended as part of this grant by our colleagues to do linked data lookups. And the third is the results of an ANIF tool, which is a machine learning or natural language processing tool, where we fed it title to Library of Congress subject headings from our catalog. And then when we give it a keyword, it then suggests subject headings as a result. So I know that's a lot to process, but the main takeaway here is um, we were trying to cast as wide a net as possible and allow for that information to come up as results. Um, so I'll hand it to Astrid. Um, so this appealed to both experienced and inexperienced users, but um, both caveated, like heavily caveated, that only if the quality of the suggestions is good, which is obviously a really difficult challenge. So another issue with this one was the amount of information displayed. Um, we need to do more work to lay this out um, such that there's sufficient information but doesn't overwhelm the user or distract them from the original search. So um, definitely promising again, but um, more work to be done. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, we also try to look at auto-suggest. So that's a different way of being able to suggest results to users. And we focused on four types of entities, authors, locations, subjects, and genres. So in this example, you've typed in Vulcan, and it's matching against not just uh, entities that start with Vulcan, but also in this case, variant labels that start with Vulcan or have the word, you know, any kind of label that has the word Vulcan in it. Here's an example where you're seeing all four types of entities come back, authors, genres, locations, and subjects. And so what we're doing is we are um, uh, mapping against um, variant labels, as I said. So in this example, you type in Adams and that matches against a variant label. And you can see the preferred label here. You can also see a Wikidata description and the count relates to how many of these results are in the count. Um, it matches against variant labels for subjects, so heart attack will give you myocardial infarction. We should probably get a different uh, example other than myocardial infarction one day, and one day we will. Um, and also, it uses the see also information in the Library of Congress and the pseudonym information in Wikidata to be able to match on pseudonyms and to also show you if, for instance, uh, you have two related headings in your catalog, it can use that see also information to display that. You've typed in Twain, you can see the main heading there and you'll find search results there, but it's also telling you that Samuel Clemens uh, is a separate but related heading you can use. And you can click on both of those. And as I mentioned, the Wikidata information provides additional context to, to help disambiguate between which Max Weber it is you're looking at. We did this by setting up a separate solar index in a whole host of various queries that were uh, looking at data from the catalog and resolving to URIs um, and getting information from both the Library of Congress and Wikidata. Here's a very quick slide that just shows you the kinds of relationships that we're trying to bring in from both sources or all three sources if we have subjects and populate the index that um, generates the So the Cornell Usability Team conducted research on this, um, and again, they found it was very useful, but um, only if the quality of the results is good. And in fact, it could have negative impact if it's not good, because then it wouldn't be trusted, and um, you know they would have they would lose faith that it was helpful. Um, so in the very early testing that we did um, two years ago, so we saw frustration with the catalog index indexing not necessarily matching the user's vocabulary, or even if the user, you know, misspelled a word or had a typo. Um, so with the auto suggest, the user could, you know, search like as uh, Huda was showing, heart attack, and then see also myocardial infraction and learn that's the medical term for heart attack and also see results for that would make the search results even more helpful rather than having to know that the medical term is myocardial infraction. Um, we did receive feedback that the relationships need to be made more clear. So what if you didn't know Mark Twain's real name was Samuel Clemens? It'd be good to show the relationship so it's clear why we displayed that name. Um, and then auto suggest plus the knowledge panel is even more powerful. So um, one to provide the variants and pseudonyms and then the other to define the relationships or help disambiguate. Thank you. 
So a very brief word on the output. So when we started the presentation, we said our second question was, how can we help uh, library content to be discoverable on the web? This is an example uh, that the, the Stanford team and other people uh, collaborating and contributing to the core block like code um, uh, have set up where they can you can generate schema.org uh, in JSON LD within Blacklight catalog pages. So this is an example of a work where you can see name and author information. Does it actually work? Uh, we think so. So here's an example where you have a data set uh, in SearchWorks, which is the Stanford Library catalog. And this data set um, within its page has embedded JSON LD that shows information like description and the type of download this is. And if you actually go to the Google data set search and find this data set, uh, you'll see that the description matches what you, are, uh, what you have in the schema.org uh, encoding and the, also the type. So it looks like it's working and that's a good thing. Now there are a lot, there's a lot of other work that I didn't have time to go through. Um, and uh, we, we invite you to look at our documentation. Um, we did try to do a little bit with call number browse looking at syllabus books uh, and uh, co uh, suggesting things that have been co-assigned and zero uh, results pages. Very quickly, uh, yes, there are challenges and opportunities. Um, so there are two different ways that you saw us try to use the data. One is you display it real time and the other is you try to um, use different data from multiple sources to put it in an index. For the first, um, you have to make sure that it's performant. So if your queries or if you are taking too long or if you have to walk like seven different um, nodes in a graph, that's probably not the best thing. But in all cases, uh, sometimes the relationships are not there. Sometimes the data is not comprehensive. So how does the UI handle that? We want to make sure we identify the sources for library stakeholders and end users so they can see what's fueling or running the searches or the display. And viewer eyes in the catalog would really be nice because um, resolving against strings is not the most fun thing in the world and it gives us a, head, uh, a, a leg up if we have. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Astrid. Um, so we, will, we were initially focused on non-specialists, that was the low hanging fruit, but um, in the future we'd like to explore the more difficult challenge of aiding experienced researchers. They've developed their own tools and processes for researching over the years and all of uh, which seem to be very specific to their area of study. So it's a, it's a real challenge, but if we can um, help them, that would be a huge win. Um, we want to do more research on browse, um, maybe using complementary tools to enhance browse. Um, and um, also another topic that we just scratched the surface on was accessibility and ethics, um, ensuring as much impartiality as possible and doing what we can to reduce bias. And then um, finally, continuing to improve the tech and the UI for these integration areas and maybe even you see them live and working in a catalog. That'd be cool. So we have these linked data sources and in this grant we generated prototypes to experiment with what kind of discovery workflows we could support, what kind of tasks. And we're now in the linked data for production LD for P3 closing the loop grant. So I had to try to make a loop. So what we're going to try to do is see um, how far we can or how we can push this kind of work into production systems and maybe also contribute back to the black light coding community. And again, since I have to close the loop, there's an arrow that comes back and that arrow could be two things. One, it could be that people want to contribute back to the linked data sources they're seeing in the catalog. And another arrow could be if the catalog content itself is now linked data, um, that might also help us uh, understand um, and better contribute to this ecosystem. There are many, many different ways that you can uh, contribute and um, join us and help the conversation along and provide our use cases. The links at the end uh, go to the LD4 community, to the affinity groups uh, that you can participate in, and to outputs of work we've done, like the Knowledge Panel white paper or notes from the Black Lightning Data Working Group. Those notes, the links are all inside. So we welcome your contributions, and I'm well aware we're almost out of time. So thank you. Oh, and thank you to everybody who worked on this. Thank you, um, Huda and Astrid. Uh, we only have about one minute and there's a number of questions and comments that came in. Um, and I will, I wanna make sure that you at least have, you know, a, at least one, one ability to give feedback. Um, there's, uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll ask one or two. Um, 
I love that you suggest via the catalog that users edit Wikidata. Have people expressed interest in this and how can we scaffold, train, and support catalog users to contribute to Wikidata? So when we user tested this, um, the, the, so we, we tested mostly undergrads, a few grad students, um, and um, they thought it was interesting, but none of them felt confident in actually being able to edit the Wikidata. Wiki so that was interesting, um, you know, that I think it's, it's a really good thing to have on there, but we haven't found people that have been willing to actually make the edits. And with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. But as I mentioned, there are a number of comments um, and questions within the Q&A. And I will encourage uh, both Astrid and Huda, as well as the participants who have asked these questions to engage in Slack. I will do my best to try to get these posted to Slack um, uh, into the discovery track channel as um, before this meeting ends. Thank you very much. Um, up next, we have Aaron Dobias uh, from Google.